man, how, you know how bad I want to come up here and just scream good morning, you know, wake my family up because I figure they're probably asleep right now. But I've been, uh, my throat's still a little scratchy, had a little sickness this week, but by the grace of God, I'm feeling healthy now. So, uh, does it work? Yep. Heck yeah. How's that? Is that better? There we go. All right. So, uh, first I want to take this opportunity. Uh, Gary, thank you very much for allowing me to bring the word this morning. It is, I'm truly and humbly honored. And uh, if you don't know me, my name is Cody Gallatin. Uh, I am 19 years old. I graduated from high school back in May. Since then, I have been working in the uh, work field as a drafter at a metal fabrication plant right down the road. And I have, since uh, August, I believe, I've been an adult volunteer in our youth group, so I try and stay active with our youth. So, been growing up, you know, been going through adulthood, and I'm very great, grateful that I have such a great workplace. I'm very blessed that God has blessed me with such a great work ba- workplace. Have some great days experiencing adulthood, having some good days, and then occasionally I have some bad days, have some troubling days, but that's okay. Some have it worse, some have it worse than me, but we're all, we're all human. We all have our bad days. And unfortunately, sometimes those bad days sometimes can lead to worse days. And sadly, those things sometimes could fall into depression. I know that took a w- big 180, but trust me, we're, I'm going to go somewhere with this. And depression, that's depression. Now, that's what I'm really going to be putting at the forefront of this. Uh, depression, it's a very, very real thing. It's a very, very hard thing to battle with. And uh, last year, I want to talk about my uh, battle with depression. Last year, I really got catapulted into depression. Uh, in this last year, in the span of two months, uh, I lost two very important people in my life in the span of five months, just out of the blue. Uh, one of them was my cousin, Natalie. Now, Natalie, she was amazing. She was one of the greatest women that I've ever met. She was always funny, and she was always the most dramatic in the room. And she, al- she has two little amazing baby girls and an amazing husband. And my family, we just loved her so much. She was always a place for us to go. If we were always feeling discomfort, we were having a troubling week at school, we could always go there, rehabilitate, and then be sent back. She would always be the one to fight for us. She was, an amaz- she was amazing. And sadly, last year in June, uh, we lost her. But it's okay. My family, it really grew us together. It really, uh, we really grew, grew closer and we got through it together. And it was an amazing experience. Then fi- uh, five months later, I lost, uh, the other person I lost was my Bowtech instructor, my drafting instructor. His, name's, his name was Shannon Barnes. He's the reason that I'm a drafter today because he is such a great teacher. Now Barnes, you had to know him. Barnes was an amazing man. He was one of the smartest men that I knew and I greatly looked up to him. He was very, he was very smart. He was very intellect. He was an amazing teacher. He was also a very great teacher at the Word. I had some amazing biblical discussions with him. And he always made everybody feel loved and appreciated in our classroom. He treated us like, our own, like his own kids. He was amazing, and I miss him every day. Sadly, Barnes, uh, Barnes took his own life, very sadly. I've, after both of these, I felt broken. After that, it, was, it, it felt like someone just kicked me right in the gut, and all the air was just taken out of me. And I, was, I felt lost. I felt broken. I felt sad. It was a very, very, very dark chapter of my life. But luckily, I serve a God that loves me. Luckily, I serve a God who is still present with me during those times. And I and I'd serve a Lord who taught me how to triumph and learn over to my depression. It, that mo- those moments were huge stepping stones in faith for me. Taught me how to put more faith in the Lord. Even though everything may seem tough, I, had, I now have more faith in the Lord going through those experiences, knowing that God was always with me during those times. And so... I want to lead into my big idea, and that God is still present in our, dark de- in our darkest days. And so, uh, now if you could, let's open your, uh, I want to open your Bibles. We're going to open to 1 Kings chapter 19. And so in this story, we're going to be, learn- we're going to be learning about the prophet Elijah. A little backstory here. I'm going to go off the rails with this because it's a huge backstory. So it, I really encourage you to read chapter 17 and 18 of 1 Kings. They are, ama- they are amazing words to hear. But a little backstory. Uh, Israel, it fell under the king of King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. 
There were some pretty awful people if you go back and read some things. They're awful. They hated Christians, they persecuted Christians, and they worshiped false gods. Not just not very nice people in general. And they hated Elijah with a passion. Like OU fans and Texas fans hate each other with a passion. Probably a little stronger, but, you know, putting some just in it. And they hated Elijah because God came to Elijah, and because of all this wickedness, God said, I'm going to send a drought, and there's going to be no rain. And so Elijah was the one to tell them this. And, you know, they were like, okay, whatever. Drought came, surprise, surprise, because, you know, God is almighty and has all power. And so the drought came, and this drought, it didn't last just a few days. It didn't just last a few weeks or a few months. It lasted three years. Three years without rain. So you can imagine how happy Ahab and Jezebel were whenever this happened. Now, Elijah, he had nothing to worry. God provided for him during those moments. He provided him with a brook to, keep, to stay drinking and uh, have water. And even, even though there was no food because of the lack of rain, they couldn't grow crops, God provided crows to bring him food. I know it's crazy, but it's amazing. God provided crows to bring him food every single day. Elijah had Uber Eats before Uber Eats was a thing. <laughs> and so finally the day comes, and God tells Elijah, Elijah, I'm going to send rain, and I'm going to end this drought. And so to uh, basically tell him this, so Elijah tells the people this. They all gather at Mount Carmel. It's a very tasty-sounding mountain. But they gather at Mount Carmel, and they, they're trying to prove whose God was more powerful, the God of Elijah or the God of the Baals. Baal was, uh, the, Baal was the uh, false god. Yes, there we go. False god that uh, Ahab and his prophets worshipped. And so to prove who was more powerful, they prepared, they prepared two burnt offerings of a bull. They set one on one side, one on the other. One was for Baal, one was for God. And they said, whoever's God strikes down the, uh, whoever strikes down the sacrifice with fire, they are truly God. So they prepare the sacrifice, and the prophets of Baal go first. Obviously, nothing happens. And so they start doing their rituals. They start doing some even lead to cutting themselves open to try and get this prop, to try and get this sacrifice to burn up. But it doesn't happen. And I love this part because I used to be an athlete. It still hurts to say, but I used to be an athlete because at this part, Elijah's mocking them. And I love that because you know, being an a- athlete, you know, we we mock each other sometimes. Trash talk. But Elijah mocked him in this moment while they were doing their ritual. So I can just imagine a group of people doing some ritual that's not doing anything. And Elijah just laying in a hammock be like, maybe y'all aren't trying hard enough. Maybe, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe you should shout harder or scream louder. I just love that. Side note, I'm getting off the rails. I apologize. But so in the end, nothing happens. And it, it's Elijah's turn to come up and to burn the sacrifice. And Elijah... He, go, he takes it a step further, and he says, okay, here's my sacrifice. Cover it in water. Cover it in water. Because as we all know, wet wood, it won't burn. And so they did this. Elijah fell to his face, pray. Immediately, boom, sacrifice burns up. He- fire comes down from heaven, and God deli- shows his power to these prophets of Baal. And so they, all, they fell to their face and worshiped God, and the 450 prophets of Baal were slaughtered. And then, as God promised, Elijah was talking to Ahab, and there, became a, there was a small, tiny little cloud upon the horizon. And Elijah, to, Elijah told, to, told to King Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. So as God promised, it began to rain. And uh, Ahab, knowing this, he ran back to his kingdom to tell everybody. And Elijah, being on cloud nine, witnessing the great winning of God that he just witnessed, he was like, hmm, I'm hated in this kingdom, but God won. I'm going to go to the place where I'm hated. So he was so happy that he went to the places where I guarantee you he probably had a bounty on his head and just go because he thought that the war for the worship of the, of the Baal was over. So he got to Jezreel. That's where they were staying. And as soon as he got there, Jezebel, old Jezebel, I don't like Jezebel. Jezebel sent a communicator to Elijah as soon as he got there, and he, the communicator told him, hey, uh, by this time tomorrow, what you did to Jezebel's prophets, yeah, they're going to do to you 
So you're a dead man. Pretty big 180 on that one. And so Elijah, after he heard this, he became terrified, as anybody probably would, and he fled into the wilderness. So now that we're all caught up, that was a big catching up to do, but now that we're all caught up, let's jump into the passage. So here we go, starting in chapter 19, verse 4. It says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and, he said to, and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank again and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Mount, Mount bleh, nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. So I want to make my first point. Point number one is that God is a comforter. Point number one, God is a comforter. We serve a God who is so powerful and who is so mighty, yet he is also a comforter, lion and a lamb. See, we see in this story that Elijah is suffering from depression. He's scared, he's sad, he's on the run, and he's also suicidal. Let that sink in for a second. A prophet of God who was very strong with the Lord, became depressed. He experienced emotion. What does God do? God does not scold him for this. He does not send an angel that down and say, Elijah, what are you doing? Elijah, have you not witnessed me? Get up. Elijah, stop being negative, Nelly. Get up. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't scold him. What does he do? No, he comforted Elijah. He sent an angel to him because he knew he was hurting. He sent an angel to comfort him. He fed him and gave him rest. He fed him because he knew he was weak and he needed his strength. Let me tell you right now, it is not a sin to be battling with depression. I want to make that clear. We are human. Whenever God was making us, he knew that we had intricate tons and tons of emotions and feelings that sometimes they may get the best of us, they may get the better of us. And sometimes the weight of this world mixed with our feelings, they don't go so well. So sometimes it may seem like they may be crushing us down and God will never shame you for that because he is here to comfort you. God, ugh, God makes sure that we don't have to endure this alone though. God makes sure he's always going to be there to comfort you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, the son of God, who loved you so much that he suffered the sins of the world to die for you. He got, Jesus tells you, I will give you rest. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 30, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely heart, and you will find rest for your soul, souls. Let for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is always going to be there to give us rest. Let me tell you that right now, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is always going to be there for you. I promise you when you're walking through, when it seems like you're walking through hell and you're going through the hardest times of your life, I promise you Jesus is going to be right there 24-7 holding your hand, getting you through it. I promise you that. And let me tell you from personal experience, when you feel absolutely crushed by everything, that you just want to die, and you feel lost and alone, and you call out to Jesus, let me tell you, it's an amazing feeling. Because when I, I, I've battled with these feelings, I've battled with this depression, suicidal, I've had these horrible thoughts in my head that sometimes they seemed like they were beating me down. And the very second that I called upon the name of Jesus, I found peace. Where I felt, where I felt weakness, I felt strength. It was an amazing experience. And I just kept saying, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I love you. And immediately, peace and strength was restored to me. As Elijah was fed and given strength in his dark days, we can be fed spiritually in our dark days through the love of Jesus Christ who gives us strength. So, well, let's jump into this next part of the story. So starting in what I believe is verse 9. So there he came and traveled. So there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, am only left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out. I want to stop right there. 
real quick. That kind of goes back to God as a comforter because God listens to what Elijah has to say. He doesn't immediately tell him what to do. He listens, he listens. hey, Elijah, what's on your heart? Stop talking to yourself. Talk to me listen, and let me hear you. Let me listen to you. That kind of goes back to God as a comforter. But anyways, let's keep moving forward. Chapter 11, I mean, verse 11, he says, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by in a great wind and a strong wind. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces, the, and broke the rocks in pieces, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came, to him, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? God came in peace because God is a comforter. God knew all these great things, but God chose to come in peace to comfort Elijah. <clears throat> and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am only left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go and return to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you are alive, you shall anoint, I'm going to butcher some of these names, I apologize. You shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And, you shall, and I shall, and uh, Elisha, the son of Saphat, and Abel Mahola. I'm, so, I'm sorry if I mess up your names, I apologize. You shall anoint to be prophet in your place, and the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all at their knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed them. Point number two, God is in control. No matter what your situation, God is in control. God is going to be present in your situation. He's going to comfort you in your situation. And he's also in control of your situation, no matter how bad it may be. Here, God spills everything out to Elijah. He gives him a little friendly reminder. Hey, Elijah, it's going to be okay. I've still got this. No matter what the situation we may be in, God is still going to be in control. And he, he tells us in Joshua, do not be dismayed or frightened, for he, is, for he is with us wherever we go. I apologize, I paraphrase that. As God said to Joshua, God said that he was going to, God says, there we go. God is in control the whole time, and he was still working his plan out. And all these things had to come through, come through and come to pass so that Elijah may see a victory through God. He came to Elijah and said, Elijah, guess what? It's all going to be okay. All these nasty kings of Israel, guess what? They're out. You're going to anoint these people to be king over Israel, and all is going to be well. Your work is not done, though, Elijah, because I understand that you may be tired and you may be weak, but guess what? I'm going to give you a friend to help you. I'm going to get someone to help you because I understand that you're weak. And guess what? Your work did not go unnoticed. There are still 7,000 of Israel that have not kissed the name of the Baal. I promise you, your work was not wasted, Elijah. I am still here with you, and I am still working it out. I promise you. And those who seek to take away your life, guess what? They're not going to escape any of the swords of the kings that I have anointed. Guess what, Elijah? I've still got you. Man. Elijah, Elijah, I'm still in control. We all have those dark days. I understand that. And that's where a lot of our faith can come, um, come, come, can come into play. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For, new, for, you, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. When we meet our trials during our hard days, we must trust in the Lord with all our heart and stand firm in him. God is still in control. I promise you he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. He is always going to be with you. And I promise you, no matter what, during those dark days, Jesus is going to be closer to you than ever before. Because like I, when it seems like you're walking through hell, Jesus is not going to abandon you during that moment. Jesus is going to grab you by the hand. Jesus is going to lead you through to your victory. Because I promise you, Whenever, when things seem worse than ever, Jesus is going to be closer than ever because Jesus is not going to miss a moment to show his love to you when you need it, I promise you. He will not pass up and on an opportunity to show his love to his children, to the ones, to you. 
God is in control of your situation. No matter what you may be battling, I understand we all come into this building. We all have things that we, personal things that we may be dealing with. I understand. I've got them too. But God is still in control. God is still seeing it out for a victory. You've got this. I promise you, you've got this. You've got this because God's got it. I promise you that. <clears throat> Man, high quality H2O. So I'm going to jump in to point number three. I'm speeding through this. I realize that. But point number three <laughs> is... God is a provider. God provides. As God provided for the Israelites with the manna and the quail and the water, God provides for all his children. So something that we learned in those last few verses is that when Elijah was tired, when Elijah, he wasn't done with his work, but when Elijah, God knew that, God, God knew that Elijah was tired and weak, and he still had work for him to do, so God provided Elijah with a prophet to help him carry out his mission. Because he knew that he was not done. He knew he couldn't do it alone. You see, back when I was in depression, I had depression, and I thought I was alone. I was so blinded by negativity. I was so tired of everything, and I thought I was alone. I was so blinded that it took me com a, completely a year to realize that God was still providing me in those moments where I felt lost. It took me a year to realize that. I realized it at youth camp. Those a few months ago. You see, when I felt alone, God made sure, hey, Cody, you may feel alone, but guess what? I'm going to make sure that you're not alone. I'm going to make sure that you've got people to help you. Because during those times, God made sure that I had my amazing family that was there to comfort me 24-7. I had my amazing girlfriend there to pray with me, to comfort me whenever I needed it. And I had my amazing best friend there to talk with me, to give me advice when I needed it, to give me scripture to help me. It took me a year to realize that, and I feel so stupid for that. But no matter what, no matter how lost you may feel, God is always going to provide. God is always going to be for you in your situation. No matter how alone, no matter how lost in the dark we may feel, we have this church body. God provides this church body, this amazing church body, who is here to comfort, who is here to pray, who is here to have joy with anybody. Anybody who walks through those doors, this is a hospital for healing. We're here, this church is here to lift you up whenever you need it. The people of this church are here to lift you up whenever you need it. Anybody who walks through those doors, I promise you that. Iron sharpens iron. God knows that we can't go through this life alone. That's why Jesus had disciples. Jesus had disciples because he, he knew that he couldn't be alone. He needed help. And so it was very, I feel like it was a very quick message, but I hope it was able to hit some of y'all in the heart. So I'm going to ask the band to come back up. And if you, if, you're bat if you feel like you're battling and you're going through a hard time, please remember those three points that God is a comforter. God is gonna, there to comfort you whenever you need it. God is still in control of your situation. No matter what, God is still going to be in control, and he's going to help see it through. And no matter what, God is going to provide for you. There's three things I truly believe with all my heart. And so as I close this message, I want to end it with a moment. I want to end it with prayer. Because <clears throat> as we all know, prayer is the most powerful thing. Prayer is the most powerful thing that we could ever experience. And so maybe you may, you've been battling, 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 battling. And it may be getting hard. Well, I want to encourage you. When you're battling, pray. When you feel like you're going through hard times, pray. When you know somebody that's going through hard times, pray. And then after all that, pray some more. And so, if any of you in this house feel like you may be battling, you may be help, let's pray. If you need prayer and you're comfortable with people of the church praying for you, 
altars are open. My left, your right, we will gather around you and pray. But if you sometimes, I understand this, sometimes you feel like it just needs to be between you and God. You want it just between, solo connection between you and God, and you just want your alone. My right hand, your left hand. The altars are open. And also while we're at it, let's worship the king. Let's praise him again more. Let's praise him for some of the victories that we may be having in our life, some of the victories that he's already exalted us through. Let's worship him. Let's praise him for how much he's done for us, how much he's done for everyone you know. And let's just, that moment that we had during worship, that was such an amazing moment. Let's go back to that moment. Let's have another spiritual moment with God. Let's praise him.